Hi, and uh, welcome to another Hopper on 6502 video. Um, this one came about as the result of uh, someone trying to build one of these boards and um, running into a problem where we couldn't diagnose it in the, um, you know, between the group in the uh, Discord server, the Hopper Discord server. Um, so more diagnostics is going to be required. And he's mailing me the board so that I can actually see why it didn't get uh, beyond the first diagnostic step. Um, but in the meantime, I decided to make a tool to help with diagnostics, uh, basically a probe. So the problem is that we got as far as um, when, you, when you're bringing one of these boards up, there's a blink example that doesn't use RAM. So um, that one's called edits, let's have a look, blink no RAM. So the first assembly program that you try and run on this device is just this, uh, it's just got a main function. Um, it's got a handler for the non-maskable interrupt, which won't work with no RAM because there's no stack to be able to store and restore the return value. And it just runs around in loops uh, using the X and Y index registers to count and then turns the LED on and off via um, this uh, via the vers versatile interface adapter yeah so those are the ports pins and there's a default one for a built-in led anyhow so what you want to do is you want to get this one running which doesn't use ram um, which means the only things you need in the board are you know the eprom that you've just programmed this program onto um the cpu itself and the via and you don't need any of the other chips uh, oh you need the um you need the cpld programmed um, that gives you glue logic as well. And with all that, um, you should be able to get a blinky light without RAM. Then you add the RAM chip, whichever RAM chip you've got, this 32 or the 64K one, and you have the corresponding glue logic for that. And then you, what you would do is you would um, do blink RAM. And the only difference between blink RAM and blink no RAM is that it calls a function which means it's using the stack to store the return value. And if there isn't, if the RAM's not working, this function will, this, this won't work, right? And that's where we got to with Todd's board and it just doesn't work. And we've, we've had like high res photographs of the bottom of the board looking for errors and uh, we he swapped out each component and we just can't figure it out. So that's what brought this about is um, going to, you know, create some diagnostic tools so that we can actually see what's happening on this board at full speed. Uh, so creating a probe for this board at full speed. And by full speed, um, I, I am slowing it down to uh, one megahertz. So one megahertz clock to see how that grows. Right. Um, so in preparation for his board arriving, um, that's what I've been working on. So let's, he's mailed his board to me, so it isn't here yet. So let's see what this is based on. So about a year and a half ago, when I was, um, before I built the Hopper uh, 6502 single board computer, I basically breadboarded um, uh, and then put onto, you know, like proto board, a version of um, Benita's computer. And I used an Arduino Mega um, as a probe. Um, because, and the reason I used the Mega rather than some microcontroller is because the original Arduino Mega and Arduino Uno are 5 volts uh, logic level, right? So that means I can um, diagnose, I can write a program that, and look at the address bus and the data bus and use the sync and the clock and the read-write signal to get the correct part of the um, clock cycle for the 6502. And then based on that, um, I wrote a little disassembler so that um, the actual output in the uh, in the serial port is this diagnostic output. So it's what it sees on the address uh, on the at each address in the in the program, um, and then it disassembles the instruction uh, with the arguments as well, um, and it gets the argument from the next cycle. And then some. Um, instructions do more than disassemble because they actually have bus activity that's not related to the source code, like writing to a port or reading and writing from the stack. 
So it's more than a disassembler. It's a probe that shows you the activity on your 6502 as it's happening. Now, as it's happening, um, running on the mega, which is running at 16 megahertz or something, the fastest I could, and I was generating the clock signal um, from this device too, as opposed to using the clock signal from the board. And the fastest I could get it to run was 850 hertz. Not kilohertz, not megahertz, 850 hertz. But it was a useful tool for diagnosing my first attempt at building a 6502 machine. And it was really handy. It's just not terribly fast. And you couldn't use this to do like an in-circuit um, version of the same idea, right? Um, so let's see what happened after that. So the next step, so that was the mega, right? And then this is um, 8 bit force, Ertürk, has got um, something that goes with megas. It's these retro shields. So you get yourself a 6502 retro shield and you plug it in over here. And you can write code that uh, makes this uh, 8 bit CPU think that it's uh, in a real environment and it gets its ROM and its RAM and its clock signal, everything from the mega. So it'll run super slow on the mega, uh, but you can run code. And I'll link to a uh, playlist at the end of this video that shows you how to get the hopper environment running on a 6502 using the retro shield. And it's designed to work on the mega. But Erturk went one step further. He did one better. Um, he discovered that um, these little boards are run at 650 megahertz, the Teensy, right? But the problem with these is just like most modern microcontrollers is that they 3.3 volt uh, voltage level, right? For all the logic. And so that means um, he built an adapter for it. And so this is from 8-bit uh, force, um, the TNC adapter. And what did he do? For these ports on the right here, he, he did logic level conversion. That's what these four chips are. They do logic level conversion from 3.3 to 5 volt logic level. So now you can, uh, you know, put your retro shield onto one of these and you can run it a hell of a lot faster. In fact, it runs at full speed because this is 600 megahertz board and um, it's providing the RAM and the ROM and the clock signal for the 8-bit microcontroller, 8-bit uh, microprocessor. So I've got Hopper running at full speed on one of these. Like I said, there'll be a link in the to the playlist for getting this stuff working at the end of this video. Anyway, that was a couple of months ago. So when Todd was having the trouble and I suggested he send me the board, I was like, okay, how am I going to di diagnose the board? Well, um, you can do... This board doesn't have any breakouts. So how am I going to plug them in? Um, you know, how am I going to plug in the address lines and all that for, for this board? So one of the ways is you can get like one of these 40 pin um, test probe clips that you just clip onto the microprocessor. But you'd have a complete bird's nest of wires here. And I wanted to like have them neatly lined up, you know, like, like that. So I built another board, this board here. It's my, um, my Hopper single board computer EEPROM jig, right? So I can get most of the pins from the EEPROM socket, from the ZIF socket. And then I only need um, uh, four, four pins that I, uh, that I can't get from the EEPROM socket. And I'll, I'll discuss which ones. So how does that work? You just take out your EEPROM from the, from the EEPROM socket and you pop it in this one in the zip socket that's on this daughter board like that and suddenly you've broken out like the majority of the pins that you need so you can just um you, you seat that in there nice and flush and now your daughter board's on board and you've broken out most of the pins the ones we're left with that aren't broken out are um let's see if i can get them on screen there so address 15 because address 15 is part of the glue logic so the high address bit, because it actually just picks between RAM and ROM or, you know, goes to the glue logic. Um, the clock signal itself doesn't go to the EEPROM socket and neither does the read-write signal. 
Um, and then the sync signal is kind of handy coming out of the 6502. It tells you when you're looking at an instruction. So the first, the, the, the fetch memory operation for fetching the instruction um, is triggered on the sync. And that can get you um, basically in sync when you're when you're doing your diagnostics. So with this, I only need to do I only need to put four um, I only need to put four wires onto my onto my clip like that. Um, so and these clips I was super impressed at how well they grab. I didn't know how they worked. Like how does it stay clicked on there, right? Well, it grabs the it grabs the chip itself, not the pins. So it's uh, it's super reliable. You know, clicks on like like that, and, and then that's the wiring done. Um, so there's the wiring done to to hook it up. And if I leave my um, my retro shield permanently plugged in here, it means that to switch from one board to another, I've just got to put I've got to wire up four pins and plug this in. Um, all right, so I'm going to plug all those wires in. Um, they all go into the five volt logic level ones on the end here, and I've grouped them nicely together here with tape so that um, it makes it easy to plug and unplug them. Um, but I'm not going to do it on camera. I'll pause and get this going. And then what we should see next is I'll, I'll, I'll open up the Arduino app that runs on this. I'm using the Arduino um, IDE to write my probe disassembler thingy and then we should see some output so let's um pause the video and i'll wire up uh, i'll plug all these in all right i'm back and i've wired it up so let's have a look at it so um move the camera so the individual wires um it's it's like 24 pins versus data and worth of data and um address bus and then the little control lines on the right it's not actually all the control lines um because one of the control lines like i mentioned before was a15 which is an address line but one thing that needs to be common across the board is ground so ground goes across so these labels are over here um on the board so if we look at them there they go i'm reading upside down but it goes you know uh sync clock uh read write and um and ground and the color coding is the same on both sides so the yellow the uh, blue and the white are the same as what these ones are um, and then yeah like i said each of those um, d0 to d7 and a0 to af are bundled like this and they're going to each of them goes into a port um, on the a, a named port because the named ports on the arduino were um, eight to a port eight bus to a port um, there we go, and we've got them hooked up, and that, the blinking that's happening on this guy is just sort of a health blink on each loop. Okay, let's go have a look at the program. So, um, turn it around so we can see most of it, uh, like that, sort of. Yeah, you can see most of it. All right. Um, so, how does the program work? Um, it I use... Erturk stuff from 8-bit, um, from the 8-bit force guys. And so he's, he's actually, uh, made a mapping between the original mega pins and the ones on the, uh, teensy that are hooked up. And then he has some functions here for quickly setting, uh, the direction, input direction or output direction of the pins. And he's got another one to put data out and get data in. So it builds from, this is actually the slowest part of the program because there's no easy way to read all eight at the same time on the teensy, well, in the same way that's nicely organized. So this is the fastest he's managed to make it so that you can read the data bus and read the address bus. Um, and then the other pins are read, write, um, phi two, which is the clock and sync. Um, I've got a, a handler for clock so i hook it up to the pin so attaching a serial uh, i mean attaching an interrupt to that clock pin on falling um and then when the clock uh, is triggered it reads the address um i use the read of one of the vectors um to signal 
start capturing. I've also got it hooked up to the two buttons because um, this board comes with um, two user buttons. So there's two user buttons, one there and one there. So I've got a way of like capturing and outputting using those as well that I was using initially when I was testing. But then I decided I'm just going to capture um, when it when it realizes that a vector, if it's not in capture mode and we're reading a vector, then start capturing. Now, why do we need to even do this? Well, um, the, to get this running at a meg, at a megahertz, um, I couldn't do the disassembly and the capture in real time. So all I could do is capture. So when it's capturing, um, it's a very it's it's this on clock here, a very small function that just does the on clock and on every clock signal if it's capturing, reads the data, reads the address, um, keeps track of whether the sync and read write pins were um, were high or not, and it just puts them into these arrays. And I capture the first um, 10 k worth of instru worth of not instructions of clock cycles, because instructions obviously can be more than one clock cycle. Um, so on reset, when you, when you reset or power up, it'll capture the first 10,000 instructions, uh, 10,000 clock cycles. And that should be enough to create a dump that shows us what's going on when the board's failing. Um, and then this is just a little health thing. Um, so it's just every second running around this thing. Okay, so let's give it a go. So if I open up, this is the regular serial log on the, um, on the Arduino ID. And if I press the reset button, it should, you know, start by going to fetch the vectors. So let's see what happens. There we go. And we have a log. So um, when you initialize a 6502, it does about, you know, 25 cycles or something before it's actually stable. And then it fetches the vectors. Um, seems to be doing some stack access as well. Um, don't know why. I mean, if I press NMI, it should, um, it won't, that won't work because it's already captured 10,000. So if you go down here, there's 10,000 instructions here, but because it's running around in a little loop somewhere, a lot of it is decrement Y and then branch if not equal. So if we go and look at the program again, let's have a look. Yeah, the inner loop of delay is decrement Y and then branch if not equal. And it's more obvious if we go and look at the assembly listing. So that inner loop inside delay is over here. Decrement Y, branch not equal to here. So this little loop is running around here. You can see the address is... Um, hex co 20 is decrement y and hex um, co 21 um, is branch not equal so it's running around in circles here a lot so the vast majority of our 10,000 uh, clock cycles are spent in exactly the same place um, but if it fails it won't get that far right so let's see how it starts so um, let's see if this matches the code so yeah um, what's this this, uh, oh, clear the decimal mode. So, you, you know, 6502s can run in uh, binary coded decimal mode, which no one ever uses, but we want to make sure it's not in that mode. Uh, initializing the stack pointer, which you don't really need to do, do if you if you look at what was did with Wasmon, since the stack is circular, you don't really need to do that. But I do it because it makes debugging easier if you want to output what the stack pointer currently is and where your stack access is. So if we're looking at stack access here, when we call the method jump subroutine, right? So we jump subroutine to this address, but as part of the jump subroutine, it's going to um, push the return value to the stack and the return value is C01C, which is what's gonna happen after it returns. Uh, oh no, sorry, that's the, that's the address is calling. Um, the return address is the address after this, which would be so where's the jump subroutine? Here's the jump subroutine. The return address is going to be, oh, actually it's just, um, is it this jump subroutine or that one? See, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we missed it too. Writing to the stack, CO, writing to the stack, CO again. CO, CO would put us over here, which is not right. Um, we might just be missing it or we, we're missing the value here. It's one of these is wrong somehow. Um, but it is working. So, cause it does come back and loop around and blink the light again, but this is the stack activity that happens inside jump subroutine. And then it calls there. I think one of these is wrong. Probably this one, um, got the wrong value. It's putting onto the stack. I'm putting the right value on. It's just the, um, diagnostic tool is not showing the correct value. 
anyway. And then it calls this uh, CO1C, which is the blink, um, the blink routine. And then the first instruction, it's like A200, which is load uh, the X index register with zero immediate and load Y with zero immediate. Uh, decrement Y, so that 8C, eight, eight dec decrement Y, and branch not equal to there, boom. And then it'll just run around in circles here and while it went for, you know, 255 of these, and then it'll do the outer loop again. I don't think I'll be able to spot it that easily. If I just scroll down where it does the decrement X. Two, and there's no search in this, uh, in this log, in, in this, there's no search function in this serial monitor, otherwise I could easily find it, right? So very difficult to just spot as it's flying past like that. Uh, we'd see a different address and we'd see a DX, but anyway, it's somewhere in there. It's doing it. Anyway, uh, we can reset it and go again. So if we clear this log and then I just go and press the reset button, it should capture the first it should reset and capture the first thousand instructions again. You can see it takes a little while to um, dump the serial data, the, the, the debugged serial data. Anyhow, um, the interesting parts of this program um, is probably where I where I do the, the disassembly. And there's, a, you know, I use the biggest resource I use for this is this pagetable.com one for the opcodes. And then this guy here has a way of, uh, you know, good for uh, decoding instructions. Um, in, so you can decode them in, in big groups. Uh, so that's what this is, the operands and stuff. Yeah. Breaking them down based on, based on the opcode. And it'll also keep track of, uh, based on the addressing mode, how many more operands it's got to get. So how many more clock cycles it needs to go fetch data for. And then if it's, if, if the operands is not zero, it'll go and fetch some more operands. Um, yeah, operands greater than zero. If it's one, it's the last one, so it outputs it. If not, it'll catch the previous one as well because you've got a two-byte operand. Um, and it puts out diagnostics if something goes wrong. But yeah, basically a little, uh, pretty simple little disassembler. Um, the whole thing is less than a thousand lines of code, including some comments, um, how the whole thing works. Anyway, this is under in my uh, hopper repo under runtimes Arduino TNC. There's a project called Probe, and that's where this is. It's under Probe. If you want to see the source code, um, if you want to know how to, how to hook it up, uh, oh, this board is also in in the project somewhere. Where did I put that board? Um, it's under single bike under, under there. So. If you he has the Gerber for the board, if you want to order the little daughter board card, um, you could just plug it all together via one of these clips. Um, but this is a lot less wiring to plug and unplug between, uh, you know, so now all I have to do is pop out the zip socket and take this clip off and put it aside and I'm done. Um, and then I could plug onto a second board. So if I've got a working board and a failing board, I can compare them to each other. Anyway, this is running at uh, full one megahertz. It's a pretty useful uh, diagnostic tool. Um, in, in terms of part count, um, a lot cheaper than something that would have this many lines on it. I mean, granted, um, if you used one of these, which are pretty common, um, you'd have, uh, you'd need, uh, what? You need four of these? Um, because each of them only has, um, you know, eight, eight leads, but you could probably get away with without having the whole address bus and still know what's going wrong, but you'd need four of these devices, <laughs> um, which is, and they're plugged into the serial port. So four, um, into a serial port to hook, hook these up. Um, you need, you'd need three for the buses and one for the control lines, you know, for the clock and the sync signal and the read, write to know what's going on. Um, so. You know, the complexity of wiring up four of these or getting a, a, if you get one with more lines than this is way more expensive. The plus side is that this thing runs up to 24 megahertz. So you'd be able to run this at full speed, um, not be limited by one megahertz. I can run this um, slightly faster than one megahertz. I think I've had it running at two, but if you try and run it at four megahertz, it falls over. Um, 
and yeah, wiring up all those little guys and trying to, I mean, it wouldn't work with the Arduino IDE. You'd have to write something else to, um, you'd have to write a program to uh, talk to four different little log logic analyzers or get a more expensive one. So if you're looking at part count and cost, um, most expensive part here we're looking at is this um, this chip, this test, test probe. Um, Test clip, which you probably use even if you used one of the if you use these guys because you know it'd be you could clip them all up to there. Um, but this is I think you can get these for about uh, I think this, this was bought in the UK for about fifty pounds. They're expensive. Um, you know these are just ten buck boards. You know like a set of boards from you get five of them from um, you know, these are from JLC PCB I believe. Um, you need another one of these zip sockets. That's also an expensive component. Um, you're going to need a teensy, which is about thirty dollars, and you're going to need one of these from Irtok, which is about twenty bucks, I think. Um, so yeah, the whole thing together is it's not a cheap um device to build diagnostic tool, but it's a lot cheaper than um is you know some off the shelf tool with enough channels to deal with this. Anyhow, um. Thanks for watching. I'll just do another round here um, to close out on. So I'll go and press the reset button, hold it down, and release. There we go. Let's try something else. Let's see if I can hold both these buttons down. So I'm holding NMI and uh, NMI and reset down, and release them both at once. Let's see what happens. Oh, I should have cleared the screen first. Let's do that first, because I'm wondering if NMI is going to. There we go. That's pretty good. Um, so we did get a return from interrupt. So the NMI vector, let's go see if that's true. So NMI is CO1B, and all it does, the non-maskable interrupt just returns. So it fetched CO1B from the vectors based on holding the button down, and then it did the return instruction, and then it got the vectors. It actually restarted. Oh, oh it looks like I interrupted the decrement interesting so yeah that works so if i so if we just hit nmi it's fetching vectors so it's going to start the start the capture that's how it's working so in the middle of blinking it just started the capture oh and we've got it that's lucky i just spotted this so now we can see we can look at oh this is great i love this little toy so this here um branch not equal to uh, C20 failed because it equaled DEY equals zero. Y, you know, Y equals zero. So it jumped through um, to, to DEX, which is a 23, X23. And then it said branch not equal to uh, 1E and jump back up again to here because that wasn't. So this is the outer, the outer loop. Um, so the this outer loop here got executed that time. Uh, oh, cool to see that. So cool to see that we can also just, so I hadn't tried that before, just hitting NMI. So yeah, the two ways you can trigger the capture of capturing a thousand uh, clock cycles is the first one is the reset uh, vector, which starts the program again. And then if I clear this, and the second one is NMI because it's fetching vectors. Uh, and that just interrupts the blinking um, to call the non-maskable interrupt handler and return again. And again, I'll, I'll show you why that happens um, because we're triggering our, our capture is being triggered here based on fetching from the vector addresses. So if it's if we access the vector addresses and we only ever read them on the trip, so it, then it starts a new capture. I'd forgotten that that's what happened with NMI. Anyway, fun diagnostic tool. Um, if you're interested in building one of these yourself, uh, contact me because I'm not going to describe the wiring. Um, uh, but I will if someone shows interest and wants to build one. And, uh, you, you know, I ordered these from um, JLC PCB. So um, I have uh, boards available. And, you know, the min minimum number of boards you can order, um, well, that come by default is, you know, five little boards. So I've got four spares. So if you want to build one of these, um, let me know. I'll send you a board. And I'll also help you with instructions on um, how to wire it up. Uh, but it's a little bit of a uh, commitment because, uh, like I said, um, these parts are not cheap.
um, you know, this clip, for example, it's not cheap and you're going to need a second socket. And of course, um, you're going to need one of these. Um, yeah, there's no way you'll run this on a, on a mega. It needs, this runs at 600 megahertz. And in addition to that, I'm actually overclocking it. And I did try overclocking it. Uh, I'm overclocking to 720 megahertz. I tried, uh, overclocking it, uh, more like briefly running it at a, at a, at a gigs and, you know, without a fan on it, but it becomes unreliable. So I think at 816 is the maximum I ran it at. And I could get, I could capture the ticks for, um, uh, four megahertz, but I couldn't capture the address or the data bus. That functionality was too slow. Um, but we can run at two megahertz. Anyhow, like I said, um, if you're interested, uh, let me know. And I've got four of these left and I'm happy to donate one rather than just let it rot on the shelf here. Thank you for watching. And if you like this and you want to watch a bit more, uh, don't forget to subscribe. I'm going to put a link in the description to my original uh, project that I ran on the Mega because you could hook that up to run on. If you've got a Ben Eater uh, set up on a breadboard, you can use the Mega version because you can slow the clock down way down on the Ben Eater board. Very good. Um, have fun.